All right, welcome to the very first installment of the Owning It podcast. Um, literally just decided that was the name this morning. And, you know, this is where I chat with some of the most inspiring humans that I am very fortunate to come across in my life. Um, and people who have taken what life has thrown at them and, you know, not only accepted that, but um, used it to kind of propel themselves forward into some incredible things um, in their lives. So, um, yeah, this first episode is brought to you by Essential Talent, um, who bring you some of New Zealand's best motivational speakers. Um, and they've now just recently branched out to Australia. And my first guest uh, is actually one of the very first um, speakers to be picked up from Australia as part of the Essential Talent family. I hadn't really decided on doing a podcast really until this person reached out to me about a month ago and was like, hey, I'm coming to New Zealand. I want to catch up. Um, and so I was like, well, you know, with how inspiring this person is, I thought it would be great to do a podcast. And so here we are. Um, so welcoming my first guest, she was uh, had a spinal cord injury in 2013. Since then, um, she's become a two-time world para surfing champion. Uh, also released an incredible book called Penguin Bloom, which is an international bestseller, and then was turned into a Hollywood movie. So, um, you know, and was starring Naomi Watts and uh, Andrew Lincoln. So some pretty big names there. So yeah, I'm talking about the incredible Samantha Bloom. Thank you so much for coming and joining me today and uh, welcome not only to my new home, but also to New Zealand for the first time and to uh, the Essential Talent. No, it's very team. cool. It's very cool to be here. Yeah, no, it's Thanks cool. Um, I guess we may as well start things off with, uh, you know, how life changed in that moment back in 2013 yeah. and kind of going back to that, um, I guess, kind of just briefly summing summing up kind of how things went down and um, yeah, I guess leading into how that affected things moving forward. Yeah, sure. So uh, my husband Cam and I have three boys and so Cam and I've always loved traveling. So we thought, you know, we wanted to, we wanted to instill our love of travel in the kids. So we took them to Thailand because it's close, obviously to Australia, lovely yeah. people, great food. So we, um, we were in Thailand for, geez, I think only about three days. We started off in Phuket and we thought it was too touristy, so we headed north. Yeah. And then we just found this really cool hotel. Like it was quite remote. And um, one of the kids spotted like, a, like this observation deck. And so, you know, we all went up there to have a drink mm. and I leant on a railing and it had dry rot and I didn't realize. So I fell six meters and yeah, I broke my back. So it wasn't my favorite holiday. No, uh, yeah. And it's one of those things that just happens out of the blue. Exactly. Like you just, you never yeah. know when something like that could happen. Obviously mine happened from pushing the limits, doing double backflips over mm -hmm. a mega ramp. You know, I was kind of putting myself in a high risk situation, but you know, and a lot of people think that that's kind of how an accident like this can happen, but it can just no, happen it's from not true. leaning on a on a dodgy railing. Exactly, and doing nothing, like, yeah, nothing crazy. Yeah, and so from that, you would have, you know, obviously gone to hospital there. Um, how long was that until you were able to get home? Uh, so I spent about three weeks in hospital in Thailand. So I was in um, one hospital, which was about three hours um, away from where I had the, ac the accident. Yeah. So I went there and then, um, oh geez, I think it was like three days later, they operated on me, put rods and screws in my back to stabilize it all. Yeah. And then once I was um, stable enough, they transported me to Bangkok. And that's where they were trying to make sure I could sit up without fainting and passing out for the trip home. Yeah. So then they organized a flight and I came home with an Australian doctor and a Thai nurse. And then, yeah, went straight to the Sydney, to Sydney airport and then straight to hospital yeah. in Sydney. Yeah, and it's it's um, it's amazing. Obviously, as we know, with spinal cord injuries, like every situation's different, and all the injuries are different. But there are so many parallels that that just kind of cross over. Like, obviously, for me, um, yeah, I was in Orlando, and then I got um, shipped up to the Shepherd Center in, in Atlanta. But yeah. yeah, one of the main things was just their job is to get us into a wheelchair, make sure we're stable to then be able to come home. And yeah. I went through all that, you know, the, the passing out stage as well. Really? You just, you get um, 
super lightheaded and, and faint, you know, the blood pressure issues. And yeah. How long were you in America for after your accident? So I was in the ICU for about five weeks in Orlando. Um, so I was on a ventilator, I had pneumonia, um, all sorts going on. And, um, and we tried weaning me off the ventilator, like yeah. starting at about three weeks after the accident. And then uh, I usually you're supposed to only go for like five minutes or so, you know, to start off with just to try things out. And yeah. I pushed it to 45 minutes. Oh, wow. And then the next day I was like, oh, I'm going to do an hour. And then <laughs> my um, airway started closing up and I just started to spin out a little bit. And then next thing I flatlined and no um, they had to kind of resuscitate me and everything. Um, and so they they waited a little while before trying to wean me off the vent yeah. um, then. But then then I went to the Shepherd Center and I was there for three months before I was able to finally fly wow. home. Um, but, you know, very scary situation especially that overseas happening and yeah definitely um not knowing about insurance and costs and and all yeah. of that sort of stuff and so i imagine yeah yours would have been kind of similar yeah it was similar i mean uh, luckily we had um insurance through our visa card yeah. which pretty much paid for all the hospital bills and and i'm assuming actually the flight home it was weird i had nothing to do with any of it i was yeah. just told yep okay you're going you know tomorrow or whatever and yeah, so it did, I know it costs a lot of money, but well, luckily we... Well, because at that point, it's, you know, we're, we're in the situation where it's like all we need to focus on is our, our health exactly. and trying to, you know, get through just the most gnarly time yes. that we're either of us have ever been through. So, um, yeah, I was very lucky to have my mum and, and, and stepdad and, and kind of family kind of rally around and loads of amazing people help out with you know, all that stuff in the background, yeah. um, insurance and trying to get things covered in terms of costs. And, and that's where I was really lucky where I got a scholarship um, to be at Shepherd Center. Mm -hmm. It probably would have cost over 300 grand US. Far out, that's insane. To be there, but uh, it's very fortunate. And that's the thing is, one thing I've sort of realized after this injury is you don't realize as you're going through life and you're interacting with people, the impact that you have and yeah. like, I didn't, I didn't think I'd made that much of an impact on people. But then next thing, there's fundraisers going on in countries I'd never even been to, and yeah. um, it was just yeah, the show of support is is yeah, always it's really pretty amazing. amazing. Yeah. yeah, that's the one thing that's funny. That's the one thing I've actually learned since my accident, is that there are, there are like so many kind people out there. Not that there wasn't beforehand, and obviously yeah. I knew there was loads of like kind people, but yeah, just. That's the one thing. Like, I just have realized people go out of their way like, to help you. They really And they do. don't expect anything back. Like, they're just, they're just yeah. incredibly nice and compassionate. And, yeah. You know, it's pretty amazing. I had this kind of hang up with that sort of stuff a little bit after my accident because I think, like, with my career, I, was, I felt like I hadn't really been supported much from sponsors and stuff. But then all of a sudden these brands are going, oh, we're going to raise money for you. I'm yeah, like, well, where was right. that support when I needed yeah, it? You know? and yeah. so, but it is an amazing thing. And so that it was it was the type of thing I, at the time, I took it, um, you know, for both sides of it, like whether it was, um, I allowed myself to feel some negativity because mm -hmm. you, you well, kind of have to feel that 100%. anger a little bit. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, it's just people kind of, you know, they just want to show support and they yeah. want to, you know, they, they, they care. And um, yeah, I, I, there were a lot of kind of mental battles, which I'm sure you went through as well. Oh, mate, I, I actually think, I think a lot of it, well, a lot of it, obviously it is a physical battle, as you know, but yeah, a lot for me it was mental. Just trying to wrap my head around it. Well, did you find it hard to ask for help, like after your accident? Or like um, more when you came home? Yeah, I found it hard. Um, not so much asking for help, but just because I didn't need to ask for it, people were just giving help. And I yeah. just, receiving help, receiving charity, that sort of stuff I, I really struggled struggle, with. Yeah. Um, and just accepting the fact that my life was going to be revolving around other people helping me from then on. Yeah. Um, that was a big thing I struggled with. I and mean, that would have been so huge. I mean, it's great. You're like, you're like an independent, like young athlete, you know? And yeah, yeah it's and just a night and day contrast. Hundred percent. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 
it's insane, isn't it? Like, yeah, like you said, like in, in a split second, how your life can be amazing one second and then just like, yeah. Yeah. Kind of. But I think, um, uh, I think one of the amazing things is, you know, things like that can happen in a split second and they like uproot your life and flip th everything upside down and it just feels like life will never be good again. Mm. But I think what is really beautiful about these situations is you see these stories shine through like yours that where, you know, um, obviously there's all the struggles, but you get to a point where you, you kind of like, I guess in a way it's you accept it, but then make the most of it and go, okay, well, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to let this injury stop me. It's more, you know, I'm going to take what's happened, but I'm going to continue forward anyway. And, sure. And, and even leverage that um, and, and use it to help inspire other people. And, yeah. and you know, I've, I've watched your um, movie, so the movie Penguin Bloom, which I just thought was incredible. Um, I sobbed like a little really? baby through <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm sure it brought up a lot of, like, yeah. Yeah, but and, 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 and in both the, you know, the hard times, but also the, the beautiful, happy moments and yeah. stuff. And I think that's, you know, I, I just, I feel like I've become a much more empathetic person since the injury. and connect to other people's sort of feelings yes. and what they're going yeah. through and um but yeah i guess we'll start with the book because what did so the book would have come first right yes the book came first yeah so that started like okay so i came home from hospital and then about three months three months later we found penguin who was a little baby magpie yeah and so then cam is a photographer so he's continuously shooting photos and so um as a joke, the, um, one of the kids said, oh, why don't we start an Instagram account? Yeah. And we called it Penguin the Magpie. And it was just for a bit of fun. Mm. And then um, and then I think a journalist in Australia in Brisbane saw the account and wrote a story about it. And that's when it started going crazy. And so Cam would get, um, oh, we'd get messages from kind of like newspapers from around the world wanting to do a story on us. And we wow. thought that was pretty, pretty, um, pretty nuts. And then, that's where Cam started getting um, emails from book publishers saying we want to do a book. Okay. So we actually had no no intention of writing a book. Yeah, and you got you got uh, approached and. Yes. And well, Cam reached out to Bradley Trevor Grieve, who is actually an author. Yeah. He lives in LA, but he's from Australia, and Cam just reached out to Bradley, sort of saying, you know, they want to do a story on us, write a book, you know, what do you think? And and I think it was like 24 hours later, Bradley came came back and said, I'll write it for you. Wow. Well, so that's and, how it all started. And how did, so obviously saying that he wrote it for you, but how yeah. was, how was that process? Like how much, like obviously he would have come and you would have been there chatting with him. Were you, yes. did you do much of any of the writing itself as well or just? Not really. Uh, so Bradley, Bradley and I would pretty much Skype almost every day yeah. and we would just talk for hours and hours. And I would tell him, I'd probably tell him stuff I hadn't told Cam. It was pretty negative, as you can imagine. Yeah. And I didn't want to bombard Cam with like this constant negativity. Yeah. So yeah, so I would just tell Bradley everything really. And then, yeah, so he put so, it all into the so book. So that was as you were going through yeah, it was that pretty early on. as well. Yeah. Okay. And then how long after that did the, even the idea of the movie come, like was it the book came out and then, then that kind of led to the, Essentially, yeah. So the book came out, and then um, um, a, 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 an old friend of Cam's, she's a producer, and she's okay. best friends with Naomi, Naomi Watts. Wow. And so Emma gave Naomi um, our book, yeah. and it really resonated with her because Naomi's a mum as well. And, and that's how the film came about. And Naomi's like, I want to produce it as well, and I want to play Sam. Wow. So, yeah. So, we, uh, yeah, like, like I said, we had no intention of making a movie. Yeah. Because, you then... know, it was just us. And it's just amazing how that stuff just comes about and like how you kind of, I guess, just being open to certain things, even just like this today, the first podcast and it only came about because yeah. you sent me a message saying, hey, I'm coming, <laughs> coming to New Zealand. I want to come catch up. So I was like, well, why not? Yeah. Um, no, that's really cool. And that process of Skyping in and, and sort of talking through your story. Did you find that really cathartic? I did. Yeah. I did. I mean, Bradley, he's the, the loveliest guy. And so it was just nice to talk to him and just be truthful with him. Yeah. And, and mate, you know, I would tell him how much I hate it. And, you know, I'd have a good whinge to him and then we'd have a laugh. And 
Yeah, no, it was, yeah, incredibly helpful. It's, um, like I, you know, with writing my book, I found the same, like it was, yeah. it was something I, I, I think I started about two years after the accident, a year oh, and a wow. half, two years after the accident, I started writing it myself. And um, I didn't know where it was going to go. I thought the book might end with me getting up and walking again, you uh -huh. know, like it's kind yeah. of the, the old, you know, glory ending. But um, no, I just, uh, I kind of just worked through it. And it wasn't until a few years later, I got approached by a publisher. And it, I think it was based off like just my Instagram and Facebook posts yeah. and the captions and uh -huh. what I'd write. And um, a friend of mine, his partner, um, is an editor. So I think she approached the publisher, said, it's hey, real. you should chat with this guy. And, and they offered me a, you know, a ghostwriter, someone to come in and yeah. help me with it. And you, didn't I was just, to, you didn't want that? I just felt like I was in a situation where there was so much that I couldn't do anymore. And not that I had any sort of skill sets to be able to feel like I could write a book, but yeah. I was like, no, I, I just think it's a challenge I want to take on myself. That's and amazing. How long did it take you to write your book? Six years. Yeah, no, but you, <laughs> but you wrote it, which is incredible. Yeah, and it's, um, it, it was a journey that I, I'm so glad I did, and it was very, very cathartic. It was, and because I was writing it while I was going through a lot of the stuff as well, it, yeah. was, it helped me process a lot of what was going on. Yeah. And, um, and I had a, you know, an incredible person helping me through as sort of a life coach. Um, so having Susie help me out with the, you know, um, the mental battles, as you said, you know, it's kind of yeah. the, the obvious stuff is the physical stuff, but sure. I feel like the most impactful um, stuff is the mental battle that we have to go through. And, um, so she would just come and sit with me and we'd just talk about it and yeah. I'd record a few of those sessions. So I had that to kind of go back to and, that's, and, yeah, uh, and with helping out with the writing and, um, man, that must've been so sad for you. Like writing that, like kind of going back. Obviously, you talk about before your accident. Yeah, yeah, that was where I, because it was about three years after the accident where I felt like I hit my lowest point, mm -hmm. and that's where I kind of you know the chapter is called breakdowns to breakthroughs, and it's sort of I felt like I had to kind of reach that point to then realize something really desperately needed to change. Yes, and for me that was I hadn't taken on acceptance properly. Um, Do you accept it now? I did, and that's where you know I came up with the name of the book is owning it. I yeah. kind of, I I got to a point of acceptance, but I, for me, that felt a little bit submissive. Um, like I wanted something that was more empowering and mm -hmm. something I, that was felt like it was mine. So yeah. that's where I sort of came up with the idea. I was like, well, rather than just be like, oh, okay, well maybe I'll accept that this is my fate and this is how my life is going to be. I'm like, well, no, screw it. If this is how my life is going to be, I'm going to make it the best. <laughs> best life possible that I yeah. can and um you're a lot stronger than me I honestly I don't think I'll ever be truly okay with being like this I, I I'm not saying I'm okay with being like this yeah. uh, and I will never be okay with being like this either it's something I sh struggle with every single day yeah. um what I think really helped me was separating what is my life and what is me and that's sure. so and, and that's kind of where I felt that confidence and self-love and empowerment and stuff um, come through was knowing that things that have happened to me, what's even what's passed down to me from my parents in terms of genetics mm -hmm. and whatnot, my accident, that's, that's my life. It's a, those are the things that are out of my control. Yes. And what I feel my value is and where that lies and what I put that sort of um value into is what i have control of so whether it's you know i guess it comes back to like my attitude my effort and my actions mm -hmm. and so yeah from a self-love perspective and being confident and being okay with me and who i am that's where i find my strength yes but i'm still allowed to be pissed off <laughs> i'm my life is what it is yeah and and everything that comes along with you know even with things around relationships and and i know that things have changed there that there's still possibilities and there's still obviously you know some amazing women out there and i'm sure i'll you know i'll meet someone and yeah. um but i'm also allowed to be annoyed that um 
you know, the, the challenges around that and kind of you get thrown in the friend zone a lot and, yeah, and that yeah. sort of stuff. So yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's just part of the journey and I guess just um, finding that separation between my life and myself. Yes. I've, I felt like that was a really strong point for me to be able to kind of do that. And, and I guess it was just removing the the things about my injury and about how challenging my life is. And, you know, those aren't me necessarily because yeah, yeah. those are out of my control. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I guess we do have to accept that we can't control everything. Mm. Yeah, it's challenging. Um, now, when it came to the, the movie side of things, like yeah. how incredible was it to see your life and your story being played out by these like amazing actors <laughs> and, and was, see that? Yeah. But I could also imagine it would be a bit daunting. It was as pretty well. bizarre, put it that way. Yeah. Like I said, we're just us, like we're just a normal family. Um, but no, it was kind of exciting. It was exciting. But I, I do remember when they um, first optioned our book to make the film. And I remember saying to them, um, yeah, that's great. But I said, just I want it to be real and I want it to be authentic and not all Hollywoody. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't want Naomi at the end of the film going, yeah, life's great. And, you know, exactly. I wanted them to, yeah. Just to, yeah, to be honest, and and they did that, mm. which I'm so grateful for. Yeah, no, I felt that watching it, and that's where, you know, I obviously I would connect to a story like yours, and in, in any sense, but watching it on screen, and and just you know, as I said before, it's like the the happy moments, you know, when Penguin finally comes back and yeah, you've been yeah. missing for a while, and and you know, and just kind of seeing your family come together and and all that sort of stuff is just very touching and um so cool to see and um but i could imagine like w were you involved in the direction or production side of things very mm. much well when we had a screenwriter and he would show us like you know obviously what he'd written and then we'd be like we we did have a little bit of say like you know it's like no can you please change this or that and mm. and that was really cool and then we saw the first um cut when we we're in l.a and both Cam and I, actually, and Emma, one of the producers, oh, and Bradley, who wrote our book, we're all there together watching it, and we just went, uh -uh. like, we just, we, we actually didn't like it. Yeah. And so we met, went back and we had a meeting with the um, another couple of producers and the director and said, look, can you just please change this or, you know, and they, and they did, and they made it better. And so we saw it a few times, and every, every time we'd give them feedback and they just change it a touch. Yeah. So, you know, it, yeah. it was pretty good. But they did say from the beginning, it's not a documentary. Yeah. You know, and they did have artistic license. Mm. For example, I didn't actually smash the photos on the wall. Felt like it. Yeah. Like wiping my old life. But, I, you know, it was just like almost a metaphor of how I was feeling. Mm. And it's, I guess it's good to have that little bit of creative license to be able to show the things that you were feeling. Exactly. But in a more visual way. Yes. Yeah. I I certainly know I've felt like smashing smashing some stuff, but um, it's not so easy. No, it's not so easy. Drive my wheelchair into <laughs> yeah, you can and, ram into everything. <laughs> yeah, go on a rampage. Um, and so the with your book, it became an international bestseller, which is incredible. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, and was that prior to it being made into a film, or did the film? Yes, no, that was prior. To getting that. Yeah, so we've done two books. That's right. So yeah, so the first book was Penguin Bloom, which is essentially um, Cam's perspective, like yeah. my husband's perspective of, you know, my accident. And, and it was almost like telling my story through Penguin, because she also fell out of a tree. And yeah, it was quite cool. And then, and then we um, wrote a second book called Sam Bloom. Yeah, So that's I saw that. more like um, my, well, it's like my story. Yeah. You know, when I was a little kid, like we travel around Australia a lot. Um, Cam and I met and then we went traveling, you know, quite a lot, like through Middle East, Africa, you know, all yeah. these really cool places. And then obviously we talk about the accident and surfing. So that's sort of the first book is Cam's perspe perspective and the second is mine. Cool. Yeah. And then did different. I see there was a like a kid's edition? There is. That's actually based off the movie. Okay. It's almost like a screen, what was it, like the screenplay off the movie. Interesting, because yeah. I've thought about doing – a younger reader's edition of mine because I mean you should I've I talk a lot about sex and drugs and partying and all sorts <laughs> it's not for young readers um but 
in terms of like the messages and the story and everything I want like kids at school to Absolutely. be able to read it. You should. So I think that would yeah, be amazing. I, I'm going to talk to the publishers about whether it is the same book, just written in a different, you know, just, like yeah, trimmed written, up and yep, made a bit more um, kid friendly or whether it's just, you know, that I write another book that's more designed for that sort of reader. And, I think that'd be really good. Yeah. Because honestly, like there's so many kids with like, you know, with mental health issues. And I think yeah. your book would be amazing for that. And uh, so I'm actually next week um, going on tour or starting a speaking tour, uh, seven stops around the country for the National Young Leaders Day. So it's hey. like 12 and 13 year old kids, um, sort of leaders from, from each of the schools and they'll come along. And so it's, yeah. it's gonna be amazing. It'll like throughout the seven stops, like all up, it'll be the most people I've spoken to um, sort of collectively. But it's, um, yeah, so I, I love being able to, inspire and and sort of guide how i can I yeah mean, but yeah as you're saying like with social media these days it's it's important to um, remind especially these kids coming up that what they're seeing is not all reality mm. it's you're not getting the full story exactly. it's, it's only a little snippet of someone's life and and we tend to compare that with our entire life yeah. and feel worthless because of it yeah, or feel yeah, like yeah, less yeah, not, so, yeah. um no, i think that's unreal yeah. That's what I found actually. The one thing I do like about telling my story is that you can. Insp I don't actually. I can't bear that um, word inspire. Uh, right, I would say encourage, mean? encourage other people. Yeah. So no, I I was the same, and I I hated being called an inspiration. Yes, me too. And I f kind of figured out that the reason I didn't like it is because I didn't feel like I deserved it. Yeah. I felt like people were calling me an inspiration because I'd broken my neck. Yes. And I'm just living exactly. after breaking yeah. my neck. And yeah. I'm like, well, what's inspiring about that? But then I've kind of come around on that to embracing it a bit more. Because I think there's probably not very many compliments better than being called an inspiration. Of like course. being able to inspire others and, and encourage and, um, and be a role model. Um, but yeah, so I've embraced it a bit more. <laughs> but I do, I understand that feeling because it gets... The word gets thrown around all the so time. Much. Yeah, everyone um, uses it. It's like really. Yeah. But yeah, no, that that's the one thing I do love about like sharing my story. Yeah. Like just yeah, if you can help others, like same like you know how I got into the surfing, the para surfing. Like um, yeah, I've got three other people. Like there's there's a kid from Western Australia. He was 16 and he had a motocross accident and broke his back. Okay. And he messaged me on Instagram about surfing and I'm like yeah absolutely you know and I shot him photos of my board and then he had a board made and now he's coming to Hawaii wow. actually he, Max is probably leaving tomorrow to compete and which is just have unreal you, have you done much surfing with Barney oh well I went in I my know. first competition with Barney oh awesome yeah it was pretty funny like um that was when was that 2018 yeah. like ages ago yeah it's funny because I remember I beat him in the semis and he beat me in the final. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah so, so it was actually, he was kind of the reason why I started okay. um, getting into the surfing and competing. So yeah. Barney Miller is awesome. He's, he's, he's um, awesome. He was one, a person I connected with really early on. Or my friend Jeff actually, um, who was one of my wakeboard buddies and he um, sort of was one of the main guys to come in and help out and rally the troops to yeah, right. put fundraisers together and he was calling around going hey who can i talk to to find hmm. out about these injuries and yeah. what we can do and barney was one of the first people oh, that's that he so cool. spoke to and so i met barney and and um Kata, uh when they came to new zealand a few years ago um, i think that was around i think it was their, their film when their film came okay, out yep. um but yeah such a such an amazing dude yeah, and, um, no, that's that's so funny. Figured you guys would have crossed paths yeah, with the yeah, surfing. Yeah, yeah, no, so I can kind of thank Barney. Yeah. Yeah, for kind of getting me into the surfing. Yeah, that's so cool. And and it's funny because, you like, did you surf much before? Yeah, I've grown up at the beaches, yeah. the northern beaches in Sydney. Yeah. So, yeah, that's what we did. We used to always surf. And that's cool that it's something that you were able to carry on doing and, and obviously yeah. it's very different. It's very different and it took five years. Yeah. You know, it was... um. Funny, um, the first summer after my accident, we went up, Cam took me up to Palm Beach, which is a local beach near our house. Yeah. And um, yeah, we were just swimming and, and our friend was out there on a surfboard and he's like, come on, Sam, you used to surf, get on the board. And I'm like, no. Nah. 
And so he convinced me, so I lied on the board, he pushed me on the wave, I'm like, that's not surfing. I was pretty stubborn. Yeah. Very stubborn, I think. And so, yeah, so it took five years. Yeah, and it, it must be one of those things that's a little bit bittersweet. Like, it's very obviously bittersweet. it's amazing that you can do it, but it's not, it's it's not, not what same. surfing was. No, it's not the same. And, you know, the fact that I have to rely on cams to carry me to the water and get me out and, mm. yeah, it's not the same. And I would do anything, like, just to be able to, like, oh, and I'm sure the same as you. Grab your board and, and you know. Yeah. Like I'd, I'd been offered uh, the chance to go like adaptive Wait, wakeboarding or whatever they would call it. Would you do it? it? No, absolutely not. Yeah. Because it's like, I mean, and I would have, I would do it if I had arm function and I could sit in the chair and I could do it yeah, myself. Yeah, I mean, like, whereas this is like me sitting on something with these outriggers and I'm just getting towed along behind the yeah, boat nah. and it just it's like putting a formula one car a dr racing driver in the passenger seat of a taxi and yeah. say have an awesome time yeah 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 so it's yeah not... do you think it would rub it in too much like do you think it would make you angry i think so um like I deep did, down angry and just sad i did have an amazing time behind a boat but i was sitting on a tube like on a biscuit okay yeah just with a couple of buddies yeah and, so that's just and fun my friends though were that's wakeboarding fun. and doing flips over top of me. yeah that's okay so that was yeah that was a really cool thing what i've recently gotten into though is free diving um oh, have you? which is quite odd for a quadriplegic to do because i can't swim obviously no but, no but yeah but they just take you down yeah friends how long can you hold down. your breath for uh my record's five minutes 45 seconds um and that's where that's like insane the idea of embracing everything that i am and my injury is yeah. and everything and owning it like i've discovered that I can actually hold my breath longer because my arms and legs and body doesn't use the same blood flow and oxygen that everyone else's does. And not only that, being trapped in a wheelchair is a very like anxious feeling thing at the beginning, especially. And to be able to have overcome that allows me to overcome the discomfort of like when you're holding your breath and you're under there and yeah. you know, you kind of got to push <laughs> through it and, and also the, letting go of control yeah how do you let them know that you it's all based going... off the okay signal so like same but as how, do you scuba do, how do you do that though so no they they give the okay signal uh -huh. i'm like yep i'm okay, good okay. or not get okay. me out of here and do they just keep asking you that yeah, yeah. so every 30 seconds or so like they'll okay. i'll have a, a safety scuba diver down there with me who's got eyes on me at all times uh -huh. um, and they'll they'll just check on me like that and then the other times where say um you know i'll have uh, the free divers will swim down yeah. and they'll check. Basically, they're there to check if they're, if I'm ready for them to bring me back uh -huh. up. They'll swim down, they give me the signal. I'm like, yeah, I'm all good. And that's knowing that, hey, it could take 30 seconds for them to go back up, exactly. take a few breaths and come yeah, back come down. Get you. So it's kind of giving myself that extra time if I need it. Um, and for if they stumble or fumble me on the way up, like I've kind of got a, I don't think I've pushed it to that absolute limit right. yet. Um, what but, would you like to get to? I mean, How I, many need, minutes? I need to, I need to get to the six minute mark. That's um, insane. Do you do it in, you do it in a swim pool? Yeah. Yeah. But then I've also done a couple of dives uh, outside. So I've done, I went up to the poor nights, uh, which is some islands up North. Uh -huh. It's a Marine reserve. Really? Um, and you got in up there. Got in up how, there. How deep do you go? We did about, I think it was eight meters there. That's awesome. And then when I went to Florida in the, one of their natural springs, yeah. they've got their crystal clear water yeah. in a cave, like a vertical entry cave, uh, 12 meters down. And I sat there for about three That's or four insane. minutes on my own. That is so, unreal. Um, that must have felt so good, like how peaceful and beautiful. Like you were like essentially immersed in nature. And it was, and it gave me control again yeah. of uh, my life in a way. Amazing. It was like finally i can push myself again yeah. and hold yeah. my breath and then i've got my friends trusting me yeah. and um, that's awesome so yeah that was just uh just so cool to be able to have discovered that and that, that uh, there are still things that i can do to yeah. push myself and, yeah um so i'm just going to break the fourth wall for a minute so um if you're looking for an inspiring or a motivating speaker to come in uh chat to you at your event uh both sam and i with essential talent so you can reach out to the crew um and you know whether it's in new zealand or australia uh essential talent you know reach out to the team and if it's not one of us they've got an incredible list of speakers uh from all different walks of life so yeah reach out to the team at essentialtalent.co.nz
and uh, book one of us. We look forward to seeing you at your next event. Uh, whether it's in New Zealand or Australia, I'm actually keen to get over to Aussie and, you should come and over. do some as well. And yeah. we've got to get you back here as well. Yeah, I'd love to come back first here. First time back in New Zealand. Yep. and uh, Well, first time in New Zealand. In New Zealand, so yeah. We'll have to get you back and uh, get some events happening. Definitely. And show you around a bit more. <laughs> um, how long have you been on the speaking circuit? I don't, I don't know. Five years, okay. maybe? Yeah. Did, yeah. How did that come about? So it came about with the Bureau in Australia and um, yeah, I remember the first time I had to actually get up and speak because public speaking is like my greatest fear. Yep. Like before my accident, there's no way in the world I would ever have done it. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, the first time I had to get up and um, tell my story, I actually thought I was going to vomit. I was so nervous and yeah. It was but that feeling when you were done with it though, right? That was the reason you were like, okay, I'm going to go back and do another one? Uh, yes. You're like, I got yeah, through yeah, it. Yeah, maybe I got through it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I actually like it now. I still get a bit nervous, like Me before too. you go on and, and all that. But once you finish, and then, or actually during it, and you see um, people's reaction, like they're either laughing or they're crying, and yeah, yeah and it's kind of like yes. And the it's feedback, nice and they feeling. come up the to you afterwards, unreal. and, yeah. and you know it's that it's a you've great feeling. Touch someone, yeah. yeah. Um, I do love that. I yeah, I love that as well. Like that, I was the same. I hated public speaking. <laughs> I think I was lucky to have kind of a stepping stone into it. it was like a halfway point through the commentating i was doing yes because i was speaking to thousands of people at a time but they weren't all eyes on me yeah they were, looking at they were the watching the guys the water, yeah. yeah so um that was uh that was really cool and i think it um yeah it wasn't until after the accident and do you know um josh wood there's a aussie um is he a wakeboarder no he was a snowboarder but he he had a spinal cord injury back in i think 2000 no. Uh, he's walking again right. now, um, but had a real gnarly injury. And he was another one I connected with early on. And he was flown over to New Zealand, uh, maybe 2017, I think. Mm -hmm. And he invited me along to this talk that he had been, been flown over for. Right. And I went along and, and just heard him speak and was just, you know, got so pumped up from it. And, yeah, that's so good. And that, that's what kind of gave me the idea to get into it. And um, That's unreal. How did, how did you feel in your first talk? Uh, I was nervous, but it was only to like 20 or 30 people. So was, Oh, but if I a, even find, actually I find the smaller the group, the more nerve wracking. Yeah. Because they're right there looking at you. I do now yeah. as well. Um, but no, I just thought it was, yeah, it was, it was actually for the wheelchair company that I get these chairs through. Yeah, fantastic. So it was, it was a good kind of introductory one. Yeah. And then they've kind of been building up from there. And I went back uh, last year and spoke at my old high school, which was like did you? 2,600 kids. So that was oh, probably wow. the biggest audience I've spoken that's to. That's insane. Um, but no, that's, it's just been something I've really enjoyed. And as you said, yeah, it's the, the interaction. You see the emotion that people, you yeah. know, and people like... Um, yeah, the eyes light up at certain moments yes. and just the, the feedback you get afterwards. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's a, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. I, and actually, I like afterwards talking to the people and just hearing their story because everyone I, has a story. I enjoy the Q&A part the, the most. Yeah. I think that's my favorite part of it. Yeah, but yeah, but it's just nice afterwards. I mean, like, obviously, you, um, if you have your book there and then you get to talk to them one-on-one -on -one, Yeah. and it's just nice. It's really cool. Yeah. And it's also nice to be able to, like, one thing I really liked about it was to be able to earn an income again. Like, sure. It's just, it is nice. <laughs> it was something that kind of I thought I would never be able to do. And yeah. Then, um, yeah, so that's been really cool. And um, as I say, yeah, I've got a, got a speaking tour coming up and oh, wow. things are kind of ramping up. So just yeah, kind so of going good. with it. And, and it's good being busy. It is. Yeah. Having just, purpose, I think. Having is, purpose is huge. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That, having a goal and purpose is just like, yeah. It's kind of life changing. Yeah, I think. Um, now I saw that you were uh, you'd posted about the Wings for Life World Run, and so I was, you know, <laughs> I asked you before. I was like, "Are you going to be doing it?" But you're going to be flying. I'm going to be on an airplane. <laughs> so I'll, that, be, I'll be racing across the Pacific. Yeah, you'll be you'll be traveling further than anyone else in that time period. That's so right. Just, yeah. Yeah, actually, the catchy car won't catch me. No, no. you can't possibly. Unless they go, what, five, six hundred K an yeah, hour. New world record. There you go, incoming. <laughs> um, but no, that's cool. Like, So you've done it in, in past years, though? Yeah, I've done it quite a lot now. Yeah. yeah. It's an awesome event. 
like the energy, like I think of, of the runs, like it's unreal. Yeah. Like Red Bull, Red Bull do an incredible job. They really do, and and for them to back the Wings for Life um, yeah. Foundation and and the World Run and make it so that um, all of the money is going towards I know. toward the uh, the, the research. research. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be going out at 11 p.m. tomorrow night. Uh, West Haven Marina, so which will have already had, happened by the time this comes out. But um, no, in previous years it's been pouring rain, and um, uh -huh. but it's, it's when you're out there with so many other people, you know, able-bodied people that have just come along, mm. especially at eleven o'clock on a yeah. Sunday night to come and support and run for for people like ourselves. It's um, it's what it's all about, no, really. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I mean I love it. I remember one time we did it at Manly in Sydney and it was the same. It was poor. No, it wasn't. Oh, yes, it was pouring rain. It was freezing cold. Yeah. But, you know, still, everyone showed up. Yep. So, and I, I mean, I think every year it is getting bigger, though. It's getting bigger and bigger. Yeah, it really which is. Which is unreal. I think they're the, yeah, the highest number of sign ups here in New Zealand this year. And yeah, it's fantastic. Have to keep that momentum going. Absolutely. And... Find that cure. Yep. yep. So, um, no, that's cool. Well, hey, I think, you know, it's probably a good part to, to you know close things off here sure, but um sure. no it's been amazing you speak to get so to well. sit and chat with you and you're yeah, very you. calm I, I think it's just something that's come with practice and, <laughs> um no it's just yeah i think i don't know maybe there's something to this podcasting thing and find some other uh really cool um guests to bring on and, and share their stories and yeah, so really no, cool. thank you for for coming and we get yeah. to do a book swap, which I'm stoked Hell about. Yeah. Thank you. Man, no, thank you. Oh, good. Thanks, Thanks dude. No, man, that's awesome. Yeah.